I mean, coincidentally, my sub theme, which is on governmental transparency and accountability, is really at the center of uh, our discussion today. Because as a citizen, I draw my locus from Article 1 1 of the 1992 Constitution. And I, I wish to quote, because it's very important the sovereignty of Ghana resides in the people of Ghana, and for whose welfare the powers of government are exercised in the manner and within the limits laid down in this constitution. Now, so government acts on our behalf, and therefore, as a citizen, I have a legitimate expectation that government shall be substantively and nominally transparent and accountable at all times. So when the NPP uh, led by Nana Adeban Kwakufuabo went to the polls in 2016 to seek our mandate and was given that mandate. Our expectation was that the NPP would deliver a number of public goods that have been promised in their manifesto on their campaign promise, uh, platforms as well as obligations on po imposed on them by the Constitution. And it's therefore expected that whatever government does in the name of the people is communicated at all times and that they will account to the people frequently for what they have done. So in the next few minutes, I, I seek to assess the government, uh, how government has discharged that sacred duty over the past year. And I'll follow a similar format to uh, Professor Jima. I will highlight some of the ways in which the MPP sought to address the transparency and accountability challenges identified in the run-up to the 2016 elections. Assess the, what has been achieved, the gaps remaining, and then maybe finally I can look forward to 2018. Today I wanted to come in white for obvious reasons, but uh, I couldn't find a, a white, you know, uh, abada, uh, and powder to, you know, so let's, let's start. Um, what did the Ekufuabo and MPP promise to do to address transparency and accountability deficits? And this is really coming from their manifesto. First was to lay the foundation for the passage of an office of a special prosecutor to investigate and prosecute certain categories of cases and allegations of corruption and other criminal wrongdoing, including those involving the allegations or violations of the Public Procurement Act and cases involving politically exposed persons. Second, they were, to, they were going to require the Attorney General to report to Parliament annually on the potential liability of states, of the state, arising out of claims against the state. This was to reduce uh, the incidence of judgment debt, which as you recall, had become quite a problem uh, in the last couple of years. Reform of the public office, officer asset declaration regime with a focus on adding to the sanctions regime and then also promoting public disclosure. Amend the Criminal Offenses Act 1960 to make corruption a felony. As you understand, one of the, the, the challenges we have with our, our criminal uh, code is that a lot of the corruption offenses are, are actually felonies, you know. So um, that's, that's one of the areas that the MPP wanted to address. They also wanted to enact, popularize, and enforce a comprehensive code of conduct for public officials so as to give full meaning to the effect, um, full meaning and effect to the provisions of Article 284 of the Constitution. And of course, they promise us boldly that they will pass the Right to Information Bill. They would increase the funding of institutions whose mandate covers corruption so that they can recruit and retain a large number of professions, professionals to support investigations and education. They were going to enforce strictly the uh, provisions of the Public Procurement Act to ensure that we have competitive bidding and value for money. 
We were going to resource the Auditor General to set up a procurement audit unit to conduct value for money audits and impunity by retrieving stolen public funds, prosecuting corporates instead of just asking for a refund of stolen money. We were going to sponsor the establishment of an interactive website for reporting corruption in accordance with the Whistleblower Act 2006. So uh, these were very much consistent with the expectations, some of the expectations that uh, Professor Frente uh, uh, mentioned uh, in his welcoming remarks. And from those of us who have been watching governance and, and engaging in governance issues for many years, these were all things that uh, we have clamored for over the years. Certainly, I do not expect that these promises will be delivered in the first year of the government. Moreover, uh, timelines were not necessarily provided for these actions, so uh, it's, it's, it does not give us a, a base for us to measure. But in most cases, the most important indicator, at least in the first year, is the realistic steps taken so far that suggest that these targets are likely to be met. And that's how I proceed uh, to do this assessment. So what can we give the Kufuado MPP government credit for? On transparency, the government has continued in positively discharging a general obligation to disclose. And as I try to uh, sketch in my initial remarks, uh, this is founded uh, in the way a democratic system works. So if you are acting on somebody's behalf, it is just proper that the person knows what exactly you are doing. So that one is very simple. Disclose as much information as possible. And I think in many ways uh, that has been done. And this is best exemplified in the information provided by the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning, either through its website or the budget statement submitted to Parliament. I am particularly pleased that the finance minister provides disaggregated information on government flagship projects in the budget statement. This, is, this allows us to track the you know, one district, one factory, one village, one dam, you know, all of the flagship projects that the, uh, uh, the government has uh, uh, outlined that is going to implement. Mention should also be made of the Public Procurement Authority bulletins providing information on contracts awarded and volume of restricted tenders. Uh, coming here, I've been trying uh, unsuccessfully to try to get a comparison between uh, the uh, volume of sole sourcing in 2016 compared to what happened in 2017. But it's an effort that will continue uh, after uh, today. On accountability, First, I think the Kufuado government should be credited for setting the stage for the laying and passage of the Office of Special Prosecutor, just to echo uh, Prof. Jima's uh, 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 statement, including, for me, the Attorney General's extensive consultation with civil society organizations and other non-state actors in the development of the bill. Also, arranging before court, former public officers implicated in alleged corruption at the National Communication Authority involving the purchase of listening devices by the National Security. So that's our first case, uh, which came, I think, just before the Christmas holidays, the NCA case. Uh, that, that's the first case that's happened so far. Continued public expression of commitment to fighting corruption also reflected in formal channels open for CSO government engagement on anti-corruption targets, and also continued promise to pass the code of conduct for public officers and reform uh, the asset declaration uh, regime. Um, I, 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 I credit the, the government for this because, as I said, it is still in the first year. So as long as we still hear that commitment and we begin to now see realistic results, if after two years we are not seeing any realistic results, uh, we, we will begin to uh, also take note of that. 
I also want to mention steps taken to implement the beneficial ownership disclosure under the company's code through the establishment of a beneficial ownership register led by the Registrar General's Department. Then the initial ban on the purchase of vehicles, new vehicles, uh, setting up of a threshold on procurement and the monitoring of procurement practices. And lastly, the funding of national, the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan supports the uh, Attorney General and Auditor General, which Pongjima has mentioned. So those are, for me, credits. Um, what are the shortcomings? On transparency, now though the media remains unfettered, the 21-year-old draft legislation on the right to information um, bill, uh, right to information, is still languishing at the cabinet level and yet to be returned to parliament. The passage of the right to information bill will certainly deepen transparency, and yet government after government find all manner of excuses not to pass it. And for me, from where I stand, nobody has offered any cogent reason why it has not been passed. We've been involved in the right information bill at many stages over the years, and as of 2016, I can say confidently, and I've seen some of my colleagues uh, who have been uh, working with us uh, together on this bill, the Right Information Coalition, and that, that bill was ready to go. So uh, we don't understand why we're still in cabinet uh, after a year. And uh, also to say that in, when it was in parliament, we also had MPP members there on the committees, a plenary, and so discussing it. So it's not that it's, it's very new to them. Um, also on transparency, the Akufuado government is also continuing a bad anti-transparency culture in the continuing opacity in the handling of disasters. So for example, we are here to see a copy of the Atomic Junction Gas Explosion Report or the Kintampu Waterfall Incident Report. And this asks the long list of public interest matters where there has not been any transparency. As we continue to wait for the Kumasi Fara Asin Report, the Circle Fara Report, and in many societies, is these kinds of public disclosures lay the ground for you know, reform and for monitoring so that we don't have these things uh, occur again. So this is a practice that we really must stop. Um, and we hope that that report will be made available so that we know what exactly happened. There's also been a lack of transparency in the government's handling of alleged corruption involving appointees of the previous NDC government at the Ghana Standards Authority, Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, uh, the purchase of power badges from Ameri, the Ministry of Health purchase of substandard ambulances, and the list goes on. And in the claim efforts to retrieve from South officials the monies they are alleged to have stolen. We are often confused about which investigative body or public official is investing on matters of significant public interest. And there's no effort to coordinate this sharing of such information. So that has to change. Uh, fortunately, at least in the, in the Special Prosecutor Bill, there is actual provision for frequent disclosure uh, of information by the public uh, prosecutor, the special prosecutor on the status of cases. On accountability, the Nanada government handling of corruption scandals has also been a worry. While it's likely that in the first year of a new government, prosecutions are likely to take the form of post-regime accountability Pursuit of alleged corruption on the part of officials of the S.Y. Mahama NDC government appears to be slow. It is often said that Yoko, CID, and other state investigative bodies are investigating a number of alleged theft of state funds through bogus transactions. However, one year later, only one case has been sent for prosecution. Certainly, the situation is not helped by government and party functionaries promising prosecutions when cases may not be ready. 
This poses confusions in the mind of the public and makes it difficult to assess government's effort. Corruption involving the political appointees seems to repeat anti-accountability governance and fiscal justice practices of past administrations. The reporter scandal at the state-owned bulk oil storage company bust is a case in point. The president appoints um, a major ruling party financier as acting head of his state agency. Within a few months of the appointment, the CEO presides over the sale of contaminated oil to party-affiliated priority companies in contravention of official tender process. The sector minister establishes an internal interagency committee to investigate the matter. The minister orders the committee dissolve on the grounds that a report on a separate investigation by national security has exonerated the acting CEO. Again, in the permits floor distribution scandal, you have multiple agencies and actors crisscrossing each other to assume jurisdiction but always passing the back on who is responsible to do the investigation. In many respects, the handling of some of these corruption cases, cases suggests a disconnect with popular expectation of ethics and handling of conflict of interest. And another example is the 100,000 Ministry of Trade Award scandal, where the president concluded there was nothing wrong in spite of the ministry's own statement we show that at the minimum the conduct was unethical and offense, if anything, the treatment of the high office of the president in the way that it was done. And then similarly in the boss case, the suggestion was that nothing was wrong or because what has occurred um, was that the CEO was just following previous practice. And this was regardless of the fact that the previous practice may have offended existing procurement laws. The Auditor General had decided not to have a dedicated procurement uh, audit unit, but rather integrate uh, the whole idea of public procurement, uh, procurement audits uh, in a, in, as a regular uh, feature of, of their service. So, so far, they have trained 50 officers uh, by a specialist team from the World Bank and uh, four trainers of trainers. So I think at least we are seeing progress in this respect. And also, uh, the promise to sponsor the establishment of an interactive website for reporting corruption in accordance with the Whistleblowers Act. So we'll be tracking this issue. So going forward, um, the, the, the issue about corruption is simple. We have to increase the risk for engaging in corruption. And that means that more exposures, that the exposures should continue, and the media's uh, responsibility, um, and all of us are responsibility to expose uh, corruption, more prosecutions, retrievals of, of, of stolen money, but more importantly, public education, and that will mean resourcing the NCC. And then after uh, Mr. Amidu's uh, uh, announcement, the announcement of the special prosecutor, uh, the nominee, we have to look at the implementation of the Office of Special Prosecutor Act, uh, including uh, the regulations that have to be developed and passed, and then the financial support to help set up the office. I also want to mention the passage of the Code of Conduct for Public Office Holders, and then, of course, to ensure that um, we pass the right to information bill. Please, 2018, we don't want any more excuses.